You're listening to Scaling Impact, the number one podcast for conscious entrepreneurs changing the world. Today on the podcast, Jason Silva makes his second appearance on the show. Jason is an Emmy-nominated TV personality, filmmaker, keynote speaker, and futurist. He's best known as the host of two huge TV series on the National Geographic channel, Brain Games, as well as Origins. In the first place I encountered Jason was on his wildly successful YouTube show, Shots of Awe. In this episode, we dive into exploring the very edges of where known science ends and flow state picks up. We discuss the different brain states humans cycle through and what superpowers lie within each level. We look at the potential and implications for virtual reality technology, something Jason calls micro PTSD, and how we are on the cusp of our next jump in conscious evolution, which might be even more profound for us than the invention of language. Interesting points covered include the possibility of delta brainwaves being linked to manifestation, reality distortion fields, the singularity and what happens when you go through a black hole, answering the question, are we authors of our own reality, and why language doesn't just describe, but generates reality. So Jason, thanks so much for joining us today. Sure thing. I want to jump into some pretty philosophical stuff. Uh, I think there's entrepreneurs out there that have you know, these thoughts and these meanderings and as they go through the ego challenges of running a exponentially growing company, which by nature grows out of control. Sure. They start to crack. They start to have these existential uh, crises mm-hmm. uh, or, or it brings up the former ones they've been through. Yeah. Similar to, you know, having a baby and not sleeping for a few months and seeing how it can challenge your identity. <laughs> so I think these are important questions. And they do revolve around technology a little bit. Mm-hmm. The first one is about reality. Hmm. Are, what evidence have you come across or just ideas that you love that suggest that we are authors of our own reality? Well, um, Joseph Campbell has a great line. He says, uh, the word reality should never be uttered without quotation marks around it. Um, Others have said that reality is coupled to perception. Mm -hmm. So if you can mediate perception, you can mediate reality. Now the question here is less about objective reality and more about subjective reality but subjective reality can bleed, have reality bleed through effects and and affect objective truth. Um, Steve Jobs was known for his reality distortion field where he believed in something so forcefully and he was so eloquent and so convincing and he could move and shake a room with his with his verbosity that he changed what people thought was possible and then he changed the nature of what they ended up being able to do. And so, you know, even when I hosted Brain Games, we talked about the fact that all these signals come in and then your brain uh, has all kinds of cognitive biases and expectations and past experiences and lapses and all kinds of things that distort and color what you see. You don't see the world as it is, you see the world as you are. Um, some people feel disempowered by that idea because they're like, well, I can't know reality. It's all colored and tempered by my biases and so on and so forth. I'm like, yeah, okay, but, but you can like spin that in a different way. You can reframe what sounds like a disability or a, a, an, an inability to see reality and more realization that you can actually inform reality through your creative and linguistic choices. Language is one way. Language is not just descriptive, it's generative. Whether a belief as well, whether you believe you can or whether you believe you can't, either way, you're right. Mm -hmm. You know, you might assume a challenge and if you think, ah, I'll never be able to do it, okay, you're right. But if you think, wow, I really think I have a chance and I'm gonna pour my heart and soul into it, well, guess what? You might end up doing the impossible in some way. Um, And so, if you can steward reality through language, through your creative and linguistic choices, through the people you surround yourself with, through the ideas that you choose to expose yourself to and then act upon, you have a lot more agency over objective reality than you realize. Again, uh, the nature of your subjective reality that you have all kinds of agency over can have reality bleed through effects into the objective world. Mm -hmm. And knowing that makes us, I think, authors of reality. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about, so I I love neurofeedback training. Uh, Uh I've been to some pretty intense uh, sessions of that. Uh, I learned about the five different, my, my goal actually in learning it was to be able to reliably be able to go in and out of each brain state. Mm. Uh, so, you know, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, wow. theta, theta, 
wow, I never missed one there. But and SMR is one that they talk about, which is at the top of alpha, which mm -hmm. they often link to flow state. Mm -hmm. uh, so the high alpha. And, and just the ability to be able to use the gears that we have naturally and know when to use them. Because it's pretty annoying when you're in high beta, mm -hmm. you know, uh, caffeinated or like doing a lot of errands and stuff like mm -hmm. that, and you're trying to meditate and get into theta. Sure. Or when you're trying to get stuff done in flow state and you're in theta and you're a little too chilled out. Sure, uh, sure. Um, there's a, the idea of manifesting reality. I've seen links with uh, delta. So delta is the brainwave that has to do with like when we're asleep, it's the one that heals us. It's the best one when we're asleep. But some people have the ability to bring a waking delta. Wow. And so it's the idea, my sister actually is one of the, at the place that we went, she was one of the top three people ever mm. uh, to be able to, amp the, her amplitude of delta, waking delta and her ability to, to utilize it all the time was wow. extraordinary. Wow. And, and they actually didn't want to talk about it uh, too much. And they were, they, they seemed very nervous talking about delta and they were talking about the, the connection between what you can do in your mind in Delta and how it can manifest in physical reality. Interesting. And they actually, once I started digging down, they were really nervous about people harnessing and growing that ability without having dealt with their trauma. Oh, because then, uh, then you can attract what you fear. I don't know. Uh -huh. It just seemed like a very interesting thing. It's like, you know, I don't know if they're talking about the crazy stuff like throwing a car with your mind, like when you're angry at someone at, uh, in traffic. But I just mean, they, they seem to take it pretty seriously to the point where they didn't really uh, talk to her too much for the whole week until the end of it when they kind of got to know her, saw that she's a good person and all this stuff. They wanted to talk about it, but it was kind of interesting. When I wow. talk about authoring reality, there's an idea that, like you said, what does Steve Jobs do in that room that made it possible? What did he change idea-wise, consciousness-wise in the people in order that the, the potentiality now existed? Yeah. It doesn't mean that it is, happens and you imagine it and it's yeah. in your hand, but the potentiality seems to happen yeah. in that moment. And yeah, well, I think, I think that he uses language um, as a kind of ontological design. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Francisco Flores or Fernando Flores. He used to, he's a Chilean guy. He wrote a book called Computer Science and Cognition. Hmm. And they introduced this concept of ontological design and the power of language to shape reality um, through what he calls speech acts. You'd have to like do a little more research, hmm. but it goes back to this idea of language being generative and not just descriptive. Terence McKenna talks about ecstatic vocalization and enraptured articulation. Isaiah Berlin talks about becoming an enraptured prose being raised to the highest order. I mean, we know that eloquence can move mountains. I mean, compelling politicians, whether it's inspirational like Trump or, sorry, inspirational, whoops, <laughs> inspirational like Obama, or even, you know, even Trump who, you, you know, you may not like his ideas, but he seems to have mastered the art of reality distortion. Mm -hmm. See, these superpowers, you know, language, abracadabra, language is, is a spell. You can mm. put people under a spell. That's why when we spell words, we call them spells. And so, you know, you can have dark spells too, you know, mm. people that, that, that deploy language um, in, a, in a powerful manner, like some politicians, um, they, can, they can warp reality. They create mm -hmm. reality that sort of distortion fields that then change the outcome of reality because they change the actions, the physical actions that those people that have been distorted take in the world, you mm -hmm. know? I think it was McKenna who said, the world is made of words and if you know the words the world is made of, you can make of it whatever you wish. And, and, and it really is. I mean, if you know the password, you can go to any fucking bank account and take out any money that you want. I mean, it's like Neo in the Matrix, whether that's real or whether it's a metaphor, the metaphor is real. Mm -hmm. Like it's all language. All mm -hmm. the rules to do everything is just the right string of words and it makes things happen in the world. <laughs> or if you're a cryptocurrency holder yeah. uh, and you lose your password, you're pretty darn screwed. Very much uh, so. Very although if you find your password again, you're probably the best investor that's ever been in cryptocurrency because you didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, so, so there is this, this power of, of language to, to change things or to make manifest, right? But maybe to go a little bit more into those like synchronicities and meaningful coincidences that happen, like people say, 
Um, George Carlin talks about uh, the brain as a goal-seeking mechanism and the power of psycho-cybernetics to make manifest those goals. Mm -hmm. So he says, that, you know, you first, you first might, might have an aha moment. You come up with an idea or a goal. So that's the, the first impression. The second impression will be to write it down. The third impression will be to review your journal that night. So that's three impressions. The fourth impression will be to go to sleep, wake up, and look at it again. That's four impressions. Mm -hmm. Then you go out into the world, and the world hasn't changed, but you've changed. What you see has changed. And so when you look at the world differently, the world itself seems to change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those four primings of your brain with that goal then you're at the coffee shop and you overhear a conversation related to your goal oh my god i can't believe the synchronicity you're walking down the street you bump into somebody that can help you attain you go what the fuck well what has changed there like have you deployed a back-end code to harness the metaphysical properties of the universe to make manifest your dreams or is the world simply full of magic things patiently waiting for your senses to grow sharper mm -hmm. have you just primed your brain to extract the information that was always there but that you couldn't see because right. of the abundance that there is and the fact that your brain normally has to filter out most of the information that it deems uh, unimportant yeah. have you primed your subconscious mind to be on the lookout for all the ways to connect the dots to achieve your goals like i don't know mm -hmm. is it magic is it metaphysical is it just you tricking your brain? I mean, I, I don't know. But what I do know is that being on the, the, the subjective effect from the inside of then experiencing your capacity to make manifest, to make magic, to, to be able to set an intention and then watch it, it all start to happen automatically yeah. um, feels like magic, you know. You know, and, and, and certainly, right. certainly my own life. Like, I have video content of me at 16 years old, 1998, you know, after a couple of joints, uh, philosophizing about my future and like what I wanted to do and how I saw myself like speaking on stages and talking about technology and imagination and ideas and creativity. And it's like, well, what, what was that? There was a, there was a, a certainty certain back then. There was a feeling of insight, a feeling of clarity. I guess that was the first impression. The second impression was that I recorded it. Third impression was that I would watch my content, you know, like, what did, did that, did that prime my brain to be on the lookout for the signs and synchronicities? Right. Like, did I manifest Al Gore's cable network, current TV when I was right, when I was graduating college to be the opportunity that finally gave me a direction, you know, mm -hmm. like, did I manifest the fact that I made a film that got, that got me hired? Did I manifest the guy, the showrunner that I met in 2004 in a random screening of a small film that my ex-girlfriend took me to that I almost didn't go to, who then remembered our conversation six months later when he was the showrunner for Brain Games. And he was like, hey, I remember we met at the screening, da, 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 I'm doing this show. Like all these things in my life seem to be like I manifested the opportunity that took my, took my life to the next level. Right. And since then, it has given me a faith, as I said before, in... in in having a compass instead of a map, you know, mm -hmm. because I don't always know what I want. You know, sometimes I, what I want is the unknown unknown. And so now it's become about planting seeds, making content, seeding that content into the world and then letting it go. And then mm -hmm. seeing what that content does, the ripples that it has, the minds that it shifts, the people's brains that it warps or distorts for the better, that then turns into a feedback loop that comes back to me in the form of an email, invite, or inquiry, or opportunity that I wake up to tomorrow that's like, mm -hmm. aha, that's my next thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like my whole life seems like a series of feedback loops and manifestations, right. you know, and all that it's really required is for me to plant the seeds when I'm most inspired. And the truth is that all the significant shifts in my life, all the big moves in my life, the moments in which I took action, whether that action was like, making the video, making the recording, sharing that video, editing that video, all happened in altered states. Mm. I don't know if that means I was in Delta. Maybe I was. Mm. You know, I would like to study whether altered states of consciousness uh, are, include being in Delta. Mm. Like when people... Yeah, well, I'm sure in a sense, each brainwave is different. It's altered yeah. from the other. Yeah. Um, there's people that go into gamma, which is often linked to really powerful spiritual experiences mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. like some shaking energy mm -hmm. shooting through your body mm -hmm. in a way mm -hmm. that you're not familiar with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's other people that do that every day. You know, like, so it's not altered for them, but for other people, they had this life-changing experience one time. Right. Um, but with Delta, yeah, without going into it too much more, it just seemed interesting. There was a time where I was trying to figure out my beliefs on everything. Yeah. And I, it led to a dark corner. <sighs> and then I kind of wandered out uh, and had to attach ideas, you know, the whole idea yeah. of um, holding ideas that you love. Yeah. And it just seemed like there was a practical philosophy that I had to create yeah. for myself. Yeah. And it was like, I need to know what works for me. 
and I don't really need to know what happened, yeah. how we got here, like the, all these things that we can't really quite know. I don't have to know that right yet. It's not, so on my priority list, it's not the most important. The most important is what seems to work. Mm -hmm. And so all this stuff, I had people interview me one time uh, years ago uh, about money stuff and they were talking about like, they, they had all these questions. And I, and I failed on every question because mm -hmm. they asked like, what were your affirmations that you used every day in the morning? And I was just like, oh yeah, I, I never really got into affirmations. I was always a little, I, I believe they work. And I was like, uh, who am I to program myself? You know, do I have that level of intelligence to really want to hypnotize or program myself in a certain way? Is that mm -hmm. a, almost like a belief that you nail down about your future as mm -hmm. opposed to leaving it open with a compass? Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. I felt very nervous about that kind of a thing. But mm -hmm. when we talk about the um, Delta, it's, uh, it's called waking delta for a reason. It's hard to be in it when you're awake. It's the slowest brainwave. Mm. Uh, but it seems to have the most suggestible state. So I, the link I've made is that it's where your subconscious and your unconscious is linking with your conscious. Well, this is very interesting because, uh, so I think a lot about altered states of consciousness and, and what they mean, right? And, and try to reverse engineer them and figure out like what, what, what they look like or how to describe the phenomenological uh, space that you is enter. That Phenomenology. So oh, phenomenology, phenomenology is, is, a, is a, an, an account of your subjective experience. Cannabis uh, has been described by several people, uh, including a guy called David Lenson, um, as a fusion of cognition and dream. As a kind of waking dream state where the brain oscillates between like kind of dreaming while awake, like fan fantasy creation, you know, kind of like when you're dreaming. Um, but contending also with the fact that you're in a waking state with real like waking conscious uh, consequences. Um, and so I wonder if, if cannabis intoxication um, mirrors a, a Delta state. Yeah, you'd have to look at it. It definitely, the, the connection seems to be the subconscious, mm -hmm. the ability and access to it. Yeah. You know, people that, you know, say they start to cry profusely all of a sudden when they're in a, a certain type of a state, like yeah. something's coming out of them uh, on that side of things. But, I wanted to get into virtual reality a little bit. We were talking about reality. Sure. You said in the last time, the last episode, you said something about us, um, our mind turning inside out. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing a virtual reality episode you did uh, that said that about virtual reality. That, yeah. What's the quote again? Turning the human mind inside out. So virtual reality is the turning outside yeah. of the mind? Yeah. Well, I think everything... Everything we make is, a, is, a, is turning the mind inside out. You have an idea, you build it in the world, you make a painting, you write a song, you make a film. I mean, that's the human mind inside out. Gene Youngblood in his book, Expanded Cinema, said he, that, that cinema reflected mankind's historical drive to manifest his consciousness outside of his mind in front of his eyes. You know? With virtual reality, you're extending that notion of turning the mind inside out because you're creating an, an, in, an inhabitable space. Um, it's not just a place you look at and project your mind into, but it's a place that actually surrounds uh, all five senses. And I know you always speak about architecture yeah, in a similar way. Very much so. Where we create our spaces and the spaces create us. Ontological design. I mean, architecture has real cognitive impacts. The cognitive impact of built environments is a huge thing. Um, what we design is designing us back. But with virtual reality, I guess we're freed even from the constraints of basic physics. Um, and so we can create realms that are as unbounded as our imagination. So it's the human mind turned inside out minus the constraints imposed by classical physics. Um, and so, holy shit, we can really design like wake walking lucid dreams. And I think that what that will unleash in terms of human creativity uh, we can only begin to imagine. I mean, the Beethovens of virtual reality design have yet to be uh, seen and discovered, but I'm really excited. Yeah, as beautiful as the technology is today, it's so clunky compared to what it will be. Oh, you yeah. Know, in, this uh, is like Nintendo 8-bit eight, eight system, mm -hmm. you know, that we're seeing now and the speed at which we'll get to. I'm sure they'll, they'll laugh about having to wear goggles. Yeah, and <laughs> full on. All the different full elements. On. Uh, full on. So what do you, I want to get into the singularity, mm. the concept of it. A lot mm. of people aren't familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it can be very scary for some, like very yeah. exciting for others. Yeah. It seems to be just, like I said uh, about those uh, railroad tracks, there's things that seem to be getting closer together at, in, as you look at perspective sure. in the near future mm -hmm. and you look at the rate of change right. of technology growth, exponential growth curve, 
uh, and a number of other, say, multiple technologies yeah. on the on these growth curves, yeah. uh, and then how they intersect. Sure. Uh, Salim Ishmael was on yeah. uh, recently and talked about that quite a bit about yeah. the, the the new um, metric on top of it uh, when you it's when you have these stuff. intersecting technologies. Yeah. But when it comes to the singularity, can you explain a little bit about what the concept is? And yeah, I mean, the basic concept of singularity is what happens when you go through a black hole. Um, and the laws of physics, as you know, they no longer apply. So it's a term from physics that's been kind of uh, borrowed I didn't know by that. futurists, yeah, uh, because it's a great metaphor. So when they look at the future, they see these exponential growth curves. They see these advances in artificial intelligence and biotechnology, which is synthetic biology and programming biology, and with nanotech, which is patterning atoms, which is the building blocks of the physical world, the same way you pattern ones and zeros in digital tech. These three revolutions are advancing at these exponential growth curves. And for those that don't understand exponentials, 30 linear steps, one, two, three, four, five, gets you to 30, 30 exponential steps, same amount of steps, but exponential gets to a billion. So linear change is 30 steps, exponential change is a billion <laughs> progress in the same 30 steps. And so when you see these technologies advancing at these exponential rates, what it means is that in the next decade or two, we're going to see, you know, a thousand years of progress. I mean, just just, just, just numbers that, that are unquantifiable almost in terms of, uh, you know, our, our imagination. The technology already seems in a place where we have more capability than we have um, then we have imagination. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so when, when we can reprogram our biology the way we can program digital tech and when we can program and pattern atoms, which are the building blocks of the physical world, everything becomes a programmable medium. So everything becomes subject to our agency and design. And you compound that with artificial intelligence that is billions of times more intelligent than we are. And you get to a world in which everything is up for grabs, um, a world beyond our capacity to imagine it in many in much the same way that the world after the invention of language would have been inconceivable to primates on the other side of that line you know kevin kelly says the first singularity was the emergence of language that was a cambrian explosion of mind and consciousness and that we're about to approach something that's pretty similar on the back of these three technologies in silicon valley it's become almost like a new religion the rapture of the nerds but essentially it's like looking into the sun it's so bright, we can't even begin to imagine it without it burning our retinas. And so what is required is, is visionary thinking of the kind we've never seen. Um, that's maybe why so many in Silicon Valley are taking psychedelics, hmm. <laughs> because what is required is, is shaking the snow globe and getting rid of all of our previous models of the possible to conceive of what might be. I've heard you mention the book, How We Got to Now. Uh, the six innovations that no, where good ideas come from. Oh, okay, that previous was previous book. Yeah. Oh, the previous one. Okay. Yeah. I read the the other one. Yeah. And he talks about the hummingbird effect. Okay. In that, um, are you familiar with the hummingbird no, effect? No. I can't rattle it off uh, okay. as nicely as you would be able okay. to. Uh, I won't go into it, but it's just the idea that when innovations happen, this always happens where we create the internet. And we have no concept. The person who is work, working on that project has no idea how people will be able to use this. Right. They know they're creating a new stage or yeah. a new yeah. ability. Yeah. But they don't know. They're thinking maybe we could talk to one another. Yeah. You know, like like that's probably the end of it. Yeah. You know, sure. like they're, they're seeing the short distance of what we could Beautiful. use it for. And, and people are very afraid at every stage of innovation yeah. mm -hmm. where the Gutenbergs invented. You know, like this is going to destroy. Oh yeah. Uh, oral tradition. It's going to destroy history. Yeah. You know, and it actually created the books yeah. and spread them yeah. of history. Yeah. Uh, there's so many fears, and I think that's Always. the same way with uh, the singularity. Is oh, very much so. We don't know, like the sun, you know, until you're kind of beside it in the spaceship, yeah. you don't really have context to be able to... I mean, I agree. I mean, Kevin Kelly from Wired will say, you know, think of how impoverished the world would be if we didn't invent oil painting in time for Van Gogh or if we didn't invent, invent musical instruments and musical writing in time for Beethoven. So think of what's to come in, in much the same vein, like mm. new, new instruments, new construction kits for new forms of human beauty, creativity, and art that we cannot even begin to imagine. So we should invest ourselves in that, just having mm. uh, maybe the, the faith in, in creating new tools for new realities. You know? Right, well, and, and I like the idea that, for instance, oil, mm -hmm. um, you know, they used to use whale oil. Yeah. Uh, and they would kill whales, use the oil for light, you know, for candle, like yeah. for at nighttime, and yeah. they use it for a lot of different energy sources yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the time. And then they figured out coal. And it was like this brilliant innovation that sure. saved all the whales. And then it's the thing that's seeming to kill them again. Yeah. <laughs> so ironic. It, it's very ironic. Um, but I see a lot of people maybe hold on. 
we have to acknowledge that we're in a history. Yeah. You know, and think a little bit outside of time a little bit to say, okay, well, where am I? How can we be so confident that we have it figured out right now? 100% agree. Uh, and so we just have to place ourselves as the whale oil lovers, you know, all of a sudden rallying against coal, which is actually going to help in, in a certain period of time. You could be those whale lovers, and then you could be the coal lovers, and then you could be the solar lovers. Yeah. And, and we have to be able to evolve to each, and that's where we can't get wired in our dogma yeah, too much. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. We can't get wired in our dogma. Like, we have to be willing to put it all into question. You know? And, and I think those are to. really cool opportunities. So I'm imagining, like, some of the best environmental progress tech that's going on right now, just imagine in 20 years it being the thing that's really dangerous and we're trying to get rid of with the next technological innovation. Yeah. It's just we have the ability to iterate on top of ourselves, yeah. which is yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. There's something I want to talk about, which you mentioned in one of your videos. I, I don't know if you have a big philosophy about this or not. Um, it's about PTSD. Mm. So uh, in my family, uh, it's rampant. Uh, ah. Everyone has a diagnosed uh, <laughs> post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, you know, at least uh, people that I talk to and my relatives and things like that. I'm not going to put everyone under that lens, but I just know it's a common thing. And, and a lot of us have been through similar trauma together. Uh, in, in, in our background, I'm half a native uh, Métis. My mom was Métis native growing up, and uh, I have half of that in me, and there seemed to be a lot of trauma in that background. When it comes to PTSD, I want to be really respectful mm -hmm. of people that have this diagnosed uh, situation that's very difficult. I've gone through a lot of symptoms myself, and, and I've been oscillated seemingly in and out of it, which is, which is great that I feel like I could do that. I don't know if I have it, and I'm just feeling really bad sometimes, or if I have it and I'm being healed in some kind of a way. What I want to talk about is micro PTSD. Mm -hmm. So it's something that you mentioned in one of your videos, which that's why I just wanted to put that over there. We respect PTSD, the, the difficulty veterans and different people sure. have gone through. Uh, even many of the veterans that have it haven't been to battle. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot, a lot of interesting research they're doing on what is actually causing this. Mm -hmm. and, and is there a predisposition of the people going into the army that uh, might not be elsewhere? But micro PTSD, can you talk about it for a sec and help me understand yeah. what you were referring to? Uh, I mean, I just think that the, the statement was that we all have a kind of PTSD light pathology or micro PTSD if you will look deep enough. I think the first trauma, as Joseph Campbell would say, is just birth. I think if you have divorced parents, that's a trauma. I think if you were bullied in school, that's a trauma. I think if you had unrealistic economic expectations and were rejected from your college of choice, that's the, that's the trauma. In a world of individualism and in a world of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, your glories are your glories, but your failures are your failures. And if you've had a lot of setbacks in life, uh, that's probably trauma there. Now, some people have more resilience to trauma, which means that they might not exhibit any symptoms, but it is my intuition that if you look underneath the hood, all of us have had uh, our set of sufferings mm -hmm. that makes itself manifested if it's unresolved in all kinds of neurotic behavior and obsessions and compulsions. Mm -hmm. Well, and one thing I looked into when I was doing a lot of research on uh, trauma and things like that, and I'd gone through my own inner healings about serious things that I didn't know were holding me back, and it, you know, a certain thing comes up, a challenge, your behavior is throwing you off in a certain way, sabotaging you, and then you realize there's this blind spot. Mm -hmm. There's this thing that mm -hmm. is that I can't quite see, and yeah. everyone else seems to be able to see it in me. Yeah. And it keeps making me do strange things. Sure. Maybe it's time to deal with it. And by yeah. the time you're aware of it, it seems to have come up for that reason. Sure. <laughs> sure. With PTSD, I was looking into um, just trauma in general, and it seemed to be like Carl Jung. I became very fascinated with his work. Uh, just about how, I don't know if this is actually from him or not, but that was the person that drew me into psychology yeah. and understanding some of it, and the connection to, to spirituality, the connection to science, mm -hmm. things like that. He, he, when he found you know his industry, he said, this is like perfect. I wanna mix science with spirituality, with this and that, and uh, it was amazing. Uh, I like the idea of these intersecting fields yeah. that's going on right now. Me too. I, I want more data. Yeah. You know, I want more data so For we can sure. make better decisions. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and I think we could find it. So what I was getting to with PTSD is with trauma, this seems to be necessary uh -huh. in forming our identity and our ego as a child. We need imprints. Yeah. 
and it seems to be healthy, even talking to Dr. Shafali, who specializes in uh, consciousness and, and parent, parents uh, raising kids. Uh, typically, she lets the parents sit on the couch and has little Jimmy sit outside with an ice cream cone and says, it's actually, there's nothing wrong with your child. There's something wrong with your, the ego in this relationship, and it's primarily coming from the leader. <laughs> uh, so in that, identity, uh, the traumas, have you, have you looked into that? Do you have any... Uh, that imprints are good. Yeah, well, just the idea well, I think that, that they're that is, necessary, yeah. that they just well, happen. Yes, depending on your cognitive framing. So a little kid falls down and gets all scared if the mother comes and says, like, oh no, you fell. You're causing aggravation to get imprinted. If you, if you just get him up and you're like, that's good. That's how you learn. And that cut, it's good. You know, it's like, it'll heal and now you'll be stronger. Mm -hmm. Same experience, different interpretation. And it's been proven epigenetically that your interpretation of a past event can determine the physiological effects of that past event. So if something happens and for you it's like trauma and there's like negative emotion associated with it, it might cause anxiety, it might cause like all kinds of physical ailments. Um, but if you, let's say, do an MDMA therapy session and do some cognitive reframing and relive the experience through a different lens and change essentially the memory of that experience, now you won't have the same physiological symptoms anymore. So imprints, yes, for sure necessary. Cognitive framing um, is something we potentially have agency over, at least those around us that have the wisdom to steward how we interpret what happens to us can determine whether that imprint is a positive or negative one. Right, and it just seems to be, when I was talking to Shafali, I learned a lot, and one of the things that she was talking about was oftentimes in counseling, she will reinforce because uh, a lot of people want the ego death or they want to mm -hmm. get beyond this thing that keeps trying to protect them and mm -hmm. it's not necessary in our mm -hmm. day and age. There's no tigers coming after me, yeah. saber tooth tigers. There's no uh, actual threats. I'm perceiving it and it's messing with my physiology. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to get rid of that. But as a kid, she said that a lot of time people she's counseling, she has to reinforce their ego. There's sometimes like, it's not a positive thing sometimes for people not to have positive. She said there was a, a development cycle for a child to form the ego. I won't put it into her words, but I think this is what I got from it, is that the child, as they're developing, forms the ego. The identity starts to happen with imprint here, uh, you know, and sometimes it can be something so small, you know, uh, that becomes a huge inner wound that affects someone's life forever. But it's some little thing, but it was just the chemical cocktail they received upon that and the, what did you call it, um, the people's response around? The cognitive framing. The cognitive framing yeah. that they were given yeah. uh, toward that. Uh, at the time. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the ego is necessary. I think the ego, as Michael Pollan says, gets the book written. You know, he underwent all these different psychedelic sessions for writing the book. And he says that the psychedelic effect is one of shaking the snow globe. So if you suffer from an overly ordered brain, too much rumination, too much depression, too much anxiety, it's because you have these loops, these these uh, snow tracks that have been like overly like grooved in. And so you're always taking the same path, you know? Mm. Um, and an experience that jolts you out of that, that shakes the snow globe, just gives you a blank slate from which to begin again. And that can be healthy. But once you destroy the ego, you need to immediately reintegrate because right. the ego is what gives you agency and agency, it's what gets the book written. It's what allows you to plan and do and make and function. So I, I'm definitely not advocating the destruction of the ego. I'm just. The problem is, I think, an ego that has become too ordered, when it's a tyrant, mm -hmm. rather than rather than an executive. Right. And as a parent, I think about this a lot. Like yeah. I have a, I remember going to a retreat called Brave Soul with a mm -hmm. good friend of mine, uh, Philip McKernan, and uh, a quote that I'll probably have to put on a T-shirt and uh, send him one day is, "I guarantee you will fuck up your kids. Everyone in this room, I guarantee it." And, and people, because people are dealing with all this like childhood stuff, sure. or it's all coming up and they're like, oh my gosh, like the people with kids, they're so worried. Like, am I traumatizing my kids? Sure. How do I know? Like this little thing that my mom did, it didn't seem like a big deal at the time, but it's yeah. really, yeah. you know, bothered me in my whole life. And he said, that's the way, the, and it, that seems to be the way that our identities are formed. Mm -hmm. But it seems like as the growth cycle goes, we form this identity, we take socialization or, you know, whatever you call that, you almost might call it a mass hypnosis that you receive mm -hmm. from the norm around you, sure. uh, the culture that you're raised in. Uh, but then there seems to be a fully healthy growing of that ego to a certain point where you're able to actually transcend it. Uh -huh. But there's a, a, a sequence. Not everybody does. 
No. Some people stay very much in, in the <laughs> no. socialization that they receive. Me, myself, uh, me and my sister created a really funny thing uh, just one time. Uh, we made this little recording talking about, we were threatening to put it on Facebook, but we never did. But it was like coming out to the world about how we're channelers. We have the gift of channeling. And we, as brother and sister, have been channeling the ego since we were kids all day long and we do it all the day and so we actually started channeling ego uh, into this recording and like we got into the whole thing like you don't want to be in the present you want to be a little bit in the future yeah uh, thinking about the past you know like, like how does the ego actually operate and how yeah. like if you were thinking from the ego's perspective how would you optimize yeah. life from the yeah, ego's perspective for and, sure and it, unfortunately that seems to be the yeah places that yeah. we live well you know, my, my, my venn diagram that i like is the one that's between discipline and surrender and in the middle is flow so discipline is planning ahead thinking about the future etc exercise concentration discipline again surrender is let it all go be in the present da, da. and then flow is where they intersect and that's like towing the line between chaos and order hmm. you need both you need to walk that line you need to tow that line so that's where um that's where i would leave it wow well, I really appreciate you having you on. Thanks, uh, man. Uh, as a last uh, little outro, yeah. is there anything that you'd want to say to the entrepreneurs listening um, about anything that we've talked about, whether it's uh, authoring your own reality, virtual yeah. reality, the singularity, yeah. PTSD, yeah. ego? Yeah. Well, look, we've never had such an opportunity before us to positively impact the world. Um, the rate of innovation, the rate of change is accelerating at a pace that we can barely wrap our heads around. And therefore, we've never had, I, I, I just kind of, I, I implore each and every one of you to kind of dream bigger than ever before, to get out there and try to make a difference, to forge a noble aim, to carve your compass, and to go out there and make shit happen. Nice. Well, thanks for having, thanks, for coming man. on. Appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We take every listener to this podcast very seriously, and we'd love to keep in touch with you directly. So please subscribe to our Scaling Impact community by subscribing to our email list at exv.ai forward slash podcast. That's exv.ai forward slash podcast.